The Impact Lounge is the number one place to be for the real Impact Wrestling fans. One, two, one, two. You know how we do. It is BQ and Row the Great with the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review, the greatest Impact Wrestling Review of all the times. That's my Anthony. What the hell's his name? Morelli? Yeah, Corelli. Corelli. I think. I'm thinking of Morella. Whatever. The greatest of all the times. BQ here with Row the Great. Funny thing, I thought Adam was uh, going to be here this week, and I was like, hey, I want to do this show with you guys and because I didn't want to host it, and uh, Adam's not here, so here I am hosting it. There's a little bit of schedule conflicts, but we'll, we'll uh, once again, the three of us, be in the mix soon. I ever tell you one of my cat's names are Ro, is Ro? Wow, well, well it's, 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 Monroe. It, it's Monroe, <laughs> but we call him Ro, and I mean, it's written as R-O, so little, there you go. little fun <laughs> fact, fun fact for you. Apologies for last week's show. It got up. Uh, God, I I had it uploading in YouTube, um, and I went to bed fairly early that night because I had to work really early in the morning. And for some reason, it posted at midnight. An awful time to upload. It was uh, supposed to be scheduled for earlier, and it just uh, went up late. And a lot of people didn't really catch the show. All good though. Uh, we weren't super high on last week's episode, and probably not our best podcast in the world. But this episode, on the other hand. I thought was actually pretty excellent. What do you think? Yeah, I share your sentiments. Like the great Bill and Ted, excellent. <laughs> there we go. Uh, taking us back to about 1984 or 5 right there. Uh, probably a good portion of listeners have no idea what you're talking about. All good, though. Great, great episode <laughs> of Impact. So last week's show that Ro and I did was like heavily edited. I was tripping all over myself, and um, it took me a really long time to edit, and I actually – edited out the uh, trivia question and fan question. <laughs> so what we're going to do this week is kind of take it back to that. Now, if this is your first time listening to the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Impact Wrestling. We're going to uh, examine the main event first, though. So we're going to get the real big, meaty part, the good stuff out of the way, and then we're going to review the rest of, rest of the show as it goes. So maybe you're someone who doesn't really hang around to the very end. I hope you do. I hope today is the day that you do if you don't. But we're going to talk about the main event first. But let's get into, do, do you even remember, because we sp spoke of this last week, the uh, your trivia question, the answer to the, I feel like we're all jacked up here. Here, we'll just start off fresh. I'll, t I'll tell you what, I got a new trivia as well as a new question. But here's a trivia for this week. Well, let's let's answer the one from two weeks ago, because you said nobody got it right. Oh, yeah. Um, it was a OVE, and it was my apologies just because I think the clarification, um, what I was giving, and plus, too, what I have to take into account is not everybody's really sports aficionados who might listen in. So one of the clues that I used was pretty much with OVE being from Ohio, if you follow basketball, Cleveland Cavaliers won a championship about two years ago. And that was like one of the biggest droughts that that city's ever had. So probably a bad, you know, bad uh, uh, clue. But uh, this week, rest assured, some good clues. I, I think people will be able to catch on to this re relatively well. So, but for this week, I'm a multi-time champion with my first reign happening accidentally. Clue number two, I came on apprenticing for someone who had a, an infatuation of taking down a Hall of Famer. And then finally, the last clue is my teammate and I are night and day in terms of personalities. Who All am right. I? If you can't get that one right, you're fired. Uh, <laughs> what about so we had a we're going to we're going to get into impact really, really quickly instead of waffling around. So what uh, what was the fan question from the, the previous week? I, I want to say it had something to do with the ratings. Yeah, I don't ha have it on end, but just to touch on it, and I know we, we keep talking about it, but, I mean, it's kind of a topic of discussion because you look at this week, it looks like, and you not want to knock on wood and not get too excited, but it looks like it's moving upward week, out, week in and week out. I think this week, I want to say they hit two, 256, if I'm not mistaken, but we're seeing the past few weeks where it's going up, so... They're doing something right. People are watching. And I think 
the question that that we had or the comment that we had were, was they thought that the reason why the ratings were you know so inconsistent was because people aren't watching when it airs people are watching it at their, their convenience and you have sites that are releasing impact you know before the it actual broadcasts and i think we had talked about it uh, before it unfortunately got edited just how you know you don't really think that's it it's just it's kind of it is what it is the nature of the beast and you know what people uh cord cutting and et cetera, et cetera. i mean they are what they are yeah and i wish i remember who asked the question so we really apologize for that but um you know my whole thing on it is maybe that does play a bit of an issue but it, it's not a uh it's not responsible for a hundred thousand viewers dropping off damn near um i think that you know, we all knew Tessa Blanchard was going to win the knockouts championship, but for me, I wanted to see how she did it. Like, there's never been a spoiler that came out. It's like, I, okay, I don't even, I already know what happened. I don't want to watch it. I mean, I would think most people still have interest in watching this show, even if they choose to DVR it instead, instead of watching it live. But I, I don't think it plays that big of a role. And also, the website streaming it. I mean, if you look at the numbers, they're not game changing numbers. People streaming them on, uh, what's it, Daily Motion and all that. So, not really a uh, concern. I asked the question on the teleconference, though, of Josh Matthews. Whenever Josh is on the call, I try I try to uh, to punch in right away. I like I like talking to him, asking him a question. And what I asked was was there concern internally about the ratings being where they were at? And he said it's not concern, but it's they're cognizant of it. They're they're aware of it. He says when um, what is the website? Uh, I almost said Daily Motion again. It's Daily. I want to say it's Daily something, but the one that releases the ratings on. Fridays at one o'clock or Eastern or whatever, whatever it is. He said that he's at that time of the day, every Friday, he's, he's there. He's, he's refreshing the website, waiting, waiting. Like he's always one of the first people to know. So they're aware of it, but he said their, their main focus is not the live viewers. It's the plus three plus fives, the people who, who are still watching on DVR cause they're privy, privy to those numbers, which we're not, they just want to know that, um, you know, it's still being watched by X amount of people, even if it's at their leisure. So they're not too concerned with it. So that's a good thing, but it, it's just hard in today's wrestling world to, to not look at that. So, um, but no, I don't think it plays a, a huge role. I don't believe there's any questions in the last podcast <laughs> on YouTube because we, I mean, it, it, like I said, it went up kind of late. We didn't do a trivia question, anything like that. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, move into Impact. And we're going to talk about the main event. But let's do this. Let's go ahead and talk about the opening of the show because they tie in together. So let's talk about the opening. And then we're going to get into the main event. And then we'll uh, press on as normal for the rest of the show. So this, the episode starts off Austin Aries. He comes out with Killer Cross, Money Moose. He's cutting a pretty, pretty damn good promo here, wouldn't you say? Yes. Uh, that was great when he said, no, nobody can stop us. And I don't like when wrestlers say that because it's super like 80s. Like, let me tell you something. Nobody can stop us. You know, it, it just it's just kind of a played out phrase. But he says it. Fan responds with, I can. And Austin Aries just immediately stands up, plays into this. This is something on other wrestling programs they are not allowed to do. That I found unless you're in charge. But so I found that really, really entertaining the way he jumped up and what did he say something about his chins right slap those chins off you your three chins off you or something i didn't hear the actual dialect that he had between himself and the fan but i think the reason why it's able you're able to get away with it in impact versus other companies is because the fans never try to be part of the show I mean, you know, they might say that and then, you know, they have the exchange with the wrestler and then it ends there. But I think in other promotions, sometimes you have, you know, fans who are unhappy and then they try to be the star of the show instead of letting the wrestler be the star of the show. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Austin Aries overall just did such a tremendous job of going with the flow. And then he was just he just had comebacks and, and punchlines and he was hilarious. KM and Fala Ba come out. And uh, what about you? I was thinking this was just leading to a tag team match that was going to be Mo uh, I'm sorry, M Moss, Moose and Killer Cross against KM Falaba squash match. I mean, did you think that's where it was going? Yeah, because his promo that he came out with, it really didn't make sense. Like he it was like he was coming out saying, hey, you know, 
how you, you know he was really addressing Moose, talking about how he how could you turn on your best friend? It just seemed out of place, and you would have thought that that's where it was leading to. But what we got, man, was incredible. So we end up getting uh, Austin Aries challenging uh, Falaba, not challenging, but allowing him to challenge for the Impact World Championship. Not something I saw coming at all. And uh, I think it's safe to say, I think as viewers, we were expecting some kind of BS match. You know, I thought they were going to pull a, and that ha match happens right now, that crap. And um, I thought we were going to get a five minute bullshit match. And we got what we got was a legitimate main event for the Impact World Championship. What were your initial thoughts when you thought that, you know, when you knew these two were going to have a match? I welcomed it because it's something new. It's something fresh. I think sometimes when we get the uh, champions that we have, we always see them face the same amount of people. Sometimes to think outside the box, even though we know you know, person A or person B might not have a snowball's chance in hell of actually pulling up the upset. You know, it gives us an opportunity to see what can they do. Can they work that type type of match and with this being a main event? You know, you're taking somebody like a Fala who, you know, let's say like up until this year, he's really lost every match he's had in impact. So to have this opportunity to actually challenge for the world championship, a lot, an opportunity that a whole lot of people don't get who might be in the main event, like, it's a big deal. So I was really interested to see how they were the mat, the layout of the match was going to be. We really got a legit match here. It's crazy because, we, you, like you said, we don't see those kind of opportunities. Like, they, they actually painted this picture and told a story of where, you know, we're giving one of the lower card guys an opportunity. And it was a, it was a long match. It was it was really well well worked. Let me look up. Look up. If I had to guess, it was about 17 minutes. Let me see if I um, got a time here. No, I don't think I got I don't got a time on. If I had to take a guess, it was 15, 17 minutes. I mean, it was a match I got quite a bit of time. And usually when we see something like this, a television company is scared to pull the trigger of putting a lower card guy in a lengthy match, especially one who's been a comedy character and you know, being afraid that it's going to completely fall flat and they rolled the dice, they took a chance. I think it worked. And I agree with you. We talked about this, uh, or you, meant to, you made a YouTube comment. I thought he was going to somehow hit that brain buster on uh, Fala. Yeah, I was, I, the thing what I had worried about, I said, okay, the layout of this match, they can be either creative or they can give us the same old Fala goes for the bonsai drop. He slips, gets rolled up. I thought it was going to do something cheap, but I said, I knew Austin was going to win, but how he was going to win and I was thinking, I'm like, is he really going to hit a brain buster? We've seen in wrestling sometimes where a smaller wrestler is able to hit maybe a, a move that requires a lot of strength on a heavier set wrestler, but the move looks all sloppy. But the way that they did that, I think that had to be the most creative way they could have, where it, you know, it didn't make Fala look weak. Like he, you know, in, at the end of the day, and, and I'm sure I know he has this thing with KM, his tag team with KM, but I really think it opened some eyes and gave people uh, to, well, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. It gave people just a different perception of Fala, like, okay, we can buy this guy as maybe down the road being a potential champion. And I say that as tag team champion. Yeah, they opened up some opportunity for him. Definitely. There, there was a window that was opened up with this match. I don't know about you. I talked about this in a vlog on the channel called Impact Wrestling is really good. If you're watching on YouTube, you can click right above in the card if you want to go straight to that and check it out. But I don't know about you, and I was I, I try not to think ahead when I'm watching the show. I was 100% sure KM was going to turn on Falaba in the match because to me I was like this match doesn't make sense why they're doing it. I was thinking, okay, then it hit me. I was like they're goading Fala Ba in, who's over with the crowd. This is going to be the KM turn that we feel like we know is coming. And he was going to get very, very legitimate heat off it. I mean, I had this, you know, I think I noticed when he was standing there, and I don't know if Moose or Cross stood up or whatever, but I was like, those motherfuckers are all the same size. And it just, it just hit me. I was like, we're going to get that bully KM. And, um, you know, we don't want his stable to be too big. You know, it's hard to imagine him adding to it. But I was positive that's where they were going with it did that cross your mind at any point 
Not at all. It seems, and even when KM was coming out and I see him slapping hands with fans, the pairing with him and Fala has really helped KM get over as a face. Like you could argue before it was probably because his association with Fala, but, you know, people, uh, he has, uh, KM has a strong following. You know, even, you know, when you think about when he was doing the bully gimmick and you see now, and I think what was awesome, because I, I thought we'd probably never hear it since he seems to be face now is when he had called uh, <laughs> Austin Aries a liar. Or I think he was insinuating, are you calling me a liar? But for him to use that, that got over real well with the fans in the crowd, in the zone, uh, excuse me, in the arena. <laughs> I know that they're really over as a tag team, but Impact is just doing stuff different. So I was just like, okay, they can build a very legitimate heel with KM here by breaking up something good. I mean, by, again, just rolling the dice and, you know, so... I guess I got ahead of myself there, but in my head it just made so much sense, and I, I was was sure it was coming. But the match overall was just really entertaining. I mean, even my kids were, you know, they were supposed to go to bed, but they were watching the show with me from the beginning, and they said they wanted to watch that match, so I let them stay up, and they were very invested in it. I mean, usually they'll watch with me, and, oh, these moves are cool, these guys are cool, you know, whatever, and um, they enjoy Joe Hendry a lot, but then they were very invested in this. I haven't seen them invested in a match like this in a long time. So they just did a really excellent job. Um, the finish of the match was so freaking brilliant. Um, you know, when he went for that sushi roll, whatever the hell he calls it, maybe I pulled that out of my ass, but he was going for that roll. The way that's flawless, flawless execution by Austin Aries to turn, turn that into a last chancery. And what's nice is like submission moves. You know, you, you watch, older wrestling growing up like I did. I mean, submission moves used to mean something. And a lot of them don't mean anything now. It doesn't even matter if it's someone's finisher. Well, it's become, and cert, certain finishing moves have become transition moves. I mean, it's not finishing moves, I'm sorry. Certain submission moves have become transitioning moves. Whereas you think about in the mid-90s when somebody would hit the figure four, you know, even the sharpshooter to some degree. And what, that's why it kills the disbelief sometimes where you see P.D. Williams. Has P.D. Williams ever won with the sharpshooter? You know, but you, you think about think so. what, what Bret Hart and then Sting. I know Sting calls this a death lock. But when they hit those, that's it. You know, you're you're tapping. But I think what made it so awesome on two fronts was, f for one, it, it was the second time that Austin Aries hit the last chancery where he got the submission victory. And so that kind of made follow strong because you feel, you know, the momentum from taking the that sunset flip bomb and then, you know, being locked into that is what made him ultimately tap out. And then for Austin Aries, it establishes another finishing move for him because, you know, and we just were mentioning right now, he's used the last chancery in Impact. I don't think he's ever won with it. It's just kind of been a move that he's just done. So for him to use that, that gives him another move to do besides the brain buster. Absolutely. I don't think he's, I haven't seen him tap anybody out with it. He really took a chance doing that sunset flip bomb because that was something that could have went south very easily and it, it executed very well. The only thing I felt that was really missing from this was there was a certain amount of drama that was missing because even though the light audience was, was invested and you know, I'm still seeing the same stuff. Oh, the audience is dead. The audience is dead. Like it's, it's the audio. You, you can tell with this group. I always said that with, with the impact zone in Orlando. And I could say that cause I was there and I know what it really sounded like, but this was a, this is a much more engaged audience. You know, it's an audio thing. If you're, I was shit. Even when I was watching on Pop TV, TV, you know, you, you wish it was in HD. I was looking. I was like, man, the, this shit. The resolution on this is just so low. I mean, you're getting a lower quality product, so the audience, the audio is gonna take a hit as well. But with that being said, the only thing I was missing was that the fans never bought into Follow Bop or potentially winning. You know, because there were some good near falls, but you didn't get that. Oh, you know that. That uh, that feeling that he was gonna win. No, I know, but I think, and I, I guess I can only speak for myself, but I think just judging by what I seen on Twitter, I think people were just happy that the fact that Impact took a chance with someone, you know, who you know has been essentially a comedy guy, and they gave him an opportunity to showcase what he was able to do, even though we there was no doubt in anyone's mind that Austin Aries 
was going to retain, just given the fact that we know our main event for Bound for Glory. But the fact that there was parts in the match where it's like, no way, they wouldn't. And you want that. I think any any pairing that we're get, that you get, you want that. Who wants to see a match where it's like, all right, they have no, no shot. And, you know, you in I think in credit to creative the way that they laid this match out, because like you mentioned, they could have easily done this where it was some two, three minute match, some squash. And I know it seems it's funny talking about a squash match when you with a small guy and a big guy. And one of my last thing on it was the comment that I made is and I feel like what Don did was take a page out of I don't know if you were familiar with. Taz versus Bam Bam Bigelow back in the ECW days. Did, did you see that match? No, Are you familiar with that? No. Okay, just briefly, what they did was they had the underdog versus the favorite, but the underdog was the bigger guy. And normally in wrestling, when we see, like when you see Mysterio versus the Giant, Mysterio is the underdog. In this match, Fala was the underdog despite being the bigger guy. And they played that underdog role to Fala. And that's what made the match what it was. I honestly, and this isn't no recency bias, but when we do, you know, best matches of 2018 and Impact, rest assured, I'm going to mention this one This as being one of my favorites. Right, because it was just a different level of, of storytelling and, you know, uh, giving a guy opportunity in the window that it opened up. And can they capitalize off it? We'll see. And it was really nice. We got a clean finish. All those people around the ring and we got a clean finish. So uh, pretty crazy. But Aries gets the win. KM comes in. That's where I thought he was going to do the turn. Uh, I, I got to say, him taking that Saito suplex dress like that, he looked absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> but um, they beat the shit out of these guys. And they do that modern-day concert, concerto that I think they're calling the bear trap. That's what I crossed it on Facebook. So they take KM out. And what I said in my vlog, which was cool with the storytelling was this with this, is that I think people are more curious and wondering how km is right now than johnny impact is you know because of the story that they told leading up to it instead of just randomly coming down to the ring and getting taken out this is the last thing i'm going to say about it the window of opportunity is open if impact wants to take it obviously they're a comedy team but now that this has happened you have the sympathy built for km follow by wrestles a legit world title match you can still make them entertaining but you can also take this and transition them into a serious tag team who can compete in the division. Because, you know, having squash, I mean, uh, rubber matches with the Desi Hit Squad and just all the, you know, it's constant comedy with these guys, which is cool. You can be entertaining, but if they want to, they can add that little bit of edge. Because, you know, with Ali, how long did it take them to, to, to find that out? How do we get Ali from here to there? It took them a long time to figure it out. You know, this is their opportunity to do it. If they don't, who knows when they're going to have that chance again. Opening match of the show was the Lucha Brothers against the Cult of Lee. I was uh, I was happy to see this one too. Uh, because for the same reason. Cult of Lee is just does so much comedy. And it was nice to see them actually. For the most part. It was a little bit of comedy. But they had a pretty legit match. Because they had two guys you can't take serious. What did you think of the opener? I liked it because it gave Cult of Lee an opportunity to be back on TV because you think about it, most of the time we might just see Trevor Lee accompanied by Caleb Conley. So, you know, to see them in a tag team and this was a competitive match. It really could have went any way. And, you know, it just comes to show you that there's plenty of tag teams where they could take the belt off at of LAX and the division will be fine. I kind of was wondering before maybe they just felt like LAX was a safe choice. That's why they always put the titles on them. But they got a division now where you got your Cult of Lee, Cam and Fala, you know, to a lesser extent, Desi Hit Squad, if you want to get Z and E from the attic and bring them back. You know, those are Basement, four teams. Yeah. Or in an OVE as well, Chris Brothers. We well, got enough tag teams where, you know, it's a respectable division. So, you know, with this match and then Lucha Brothers as well. But yeah, it was really competitive. And I actually I thought Colt Lee was going to pull up the upset for a little bit. But uh, obviously, Lucha Brothers get the win. And uh, yeah. There was a moment there I thought Colt Lee was going to win. And that would have been huge for them. But the way the storyline is going and everything, you kind, you kind of knew that. The Lucha Brothers were going to win, but it was a it was a pretty competitive match, and um, he sold the shit out of that Fear Factor, that Scott Spike Fear Factor pile driver. That's what it is Fear Factor. I, is that the name? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know what? I noticed he doesn't do that uh, the Pentagon driver anymore. I wonder why. Yeah, because uh, Phoenix kind of does a version of it. So well, you know, an impact. These you know everybody's uh, using everyone else's moves anyway. So <laughs> they don't give a shit. You know, one of the com- one of the teleconferences. If we ever get Don back on, um, I- I'm going to ask that because that's just so strange. When Brian Cage won later in the night with the F5, I was just like, "Fucking Rosemary does that move. Like, that's a major move." So, yeah, really strange. Maybe they're just saying, "Hey, they may- maybe they're trying to paint that picture, or tell that story of a- if a wrestler wants to use a move, they can use a move." You know, who knows? Yeah. That's true. Which is, you know, more realistic. But yeah, pr- pretty outstanding tag match to open it up and and uh, competitive. And hopefully they find something for Cult of Lee to do. They kind of looks like they took him out of the Eli Drake equation. But uh, we'll see what happens going forward. OVE cuts a promo with um, where they're challenging Pentagon, Phoenix, and Brian Cage. We talked about this at the end of the podcast last week. So not always everyone makes it to the end. Ro and I cannot stand J. Chris doing that copycat shit to to uh, Sammy Callahan. That takes, I mean, this is like a hardcore badass team, and it's unneeded, very unneeded bad comedy that he's trying to insert in there. Yeah, it, you know, it's one of those things, too, and it kind of, and I don't know, I don't want to look too much into it, but you see when they're doing this, and you see what Dave dave's impressions are like where he's just kind of side-eyeing his brother like what the hell are you doing and then once they go into the you know because we're ov then that's when he joins in i mean like i said i don't think it's much of it he's probably just looking at his brother like what's wrong with you bro but the last thing they need to do is break these guys up i i love ove that well chris brothers yeah i really like what they're doing too and it's whatever that is like really needs to stop i don't i don't like it uh, it, it could be going in a direction where those two are kind of going to be the main guys. I could see them winning the tag team championships because they, they, they're they going to want to put a title on Sammy at some point because he's that hot. So I could see something like that happening, but I, I guess we'll see. I just, I just know I don't like it. I don't think it's funny and it, it takes away. It just takes away from me trying to enjoy their promos. I always said it really sounds like the, the shield promos back when they were good. And they were actually like intimidating and meant something, but I, I can't imagine if one of them was talking and the other was mimicking them. I mean, it completely downplays what they're doing, and um, hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. Yeah, it makes them seem. The last point is, it makes them seem more of a lackey, like you know, and that's something that you never want to get from them because they're a formidable tag team. And when you see him behave like that, or when you think about some of these attacks, he's always the one getting the short end of the stick. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think as far as title wise, I do believe that, like you were mentioning, I think Callahan takes the exhibition title from Brian Cage. I think they find some kind of creative way, whether it's some type of uh, over the top battle royal where it you take the belt off of Brian Cage without having an eat a, a, a pin. But then, too, I could see a scenario like you were saying, which. Although I would hate for him to lose in that type of form of fashion, but that'd be crazy where you have like a three on one and they all declare themselves as X Division champion. So just OVE, the group is the X Division champion. I mean, I don't know how you can <laughs> book three people to have a title, but they've done it before way back when when uh, Kazarian and uh, I forgot the other guy's name, but they were co X Division champion. Yeah, so. I, can, I can see it to where it's like a uh, no disqualification or handicap match or something like that. They're they're not going to have Brian Cage lose for the first time one on one. I really don't think so, but you know we'll see throughout the throughout the show though. But you know, I guess the last thing I want to say is his the mimicking thing is childish. That's what your kids do. No adult does that, so that's you know that's why it just really devalues what they are to me, in my opinion. Um, came and follow boss. So they're throughout the show. They're just showing them, you know, pumping them up. They're telling the story throughout the show. They're walking through the halls, and <laughs> I was hoping Sugar Dunkerton would be in there. It seemed like a lot of the lower card guys, couple couple jobbers. Um, I say jobbers, but guys that are appearing on Impact uh, from other other promotions there in Canada. We get the GWN flashback. I actually watched the show on DVR. I was like 20 minutes behind. I tried to catch up with live TV so I could count towards a viewership, but it just it never quite happened. I got very, very close, but it didn't happen. 
So I had the opportunity to flash to uh, rewind rewind through the uh, flashback, Von Erickson, the Broman. So that that one's interesting. I mean, I don't a very random match to use. I don't know if the Von Erickson are in the news or something right now. I don't, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's always a there's always something behind it, you know, which it, which makes sense. Um, or maybe they're trying to reintroduce Z and E, and you know, DJ Z was here. Maybe they're gonna try to bring in. Jesse Goddard's. Hopefully, they do not try to bring in Robbie E. So, anything, any thoughts on the flashback? It made me miss Goddard's. I think in, I think now, and especially how successful he is, he's the type of person they should want who has that crossover appeal. And I think he would thrive now. Hell, you know, if you threw him in the main event, I think during this time when he was really starting to catch his groove as a single competitor with all the backstage changes that we were having, and for a lot of people, that affected the way that they were being booked. So it just made me miss him. And I wonder what what he's doing, if he's still wrestling. I think he was doing Lucha Underground. But I, I wonder if he's still in contact with Impact Management and maybe we can see him back soon. I would like to see him back. He uh, he was gaining some fire, some steam, some momentum. You know, it's just a matter of getting him away from Robbie E. But he was definitely gaining. There was a couple things he was missing, um, just promo wise. And I remember there was a time where, you know, the bro man just got to back together and they were backstage and were like boom. And Eli Drake walked up on him like boom, like making fun of him and saying, "Hey man, what's wrong with you? We could have been champions," you know. And Goddard's was standing there just flexing his pecs like it was just it was really awkward there's just there's there's some things they got to tighten up you know like it was just it was just an awkward you could look that up on youtube and it was just it was just weird um but yeah i I do kind of miss him too he's someone that i really think if he came back could be can be could be in the mix you have but you have to bring him back and have him strong immediately you know you can't have him foddering in the mid card and you know, oh, he used to be with the bro, man. It's like, don't even, don't even bring that shit up. That was one of my most disappointing, because I liked, what, did you like Goddard's and Eli Drake when they were together for that short time? Yeah, I thought they were, they were fine for what they were. But I, I think though, too, you know, if they were to bring them back, what they're going to have to do, especially because I would assume maybe you bring them back as a face, they got to get away from that, you know, what gets him over is because he's in a tremendous shape, because that's, we've seen that gimmick all throughout wrestling. And I think with him, it was too much similar to, uh, what's that guy's name? The model. I don't know his name. You know, yeah. And I think you kind of have to get away from that. But I think as far as that tag team that they had, it was fine. You know, two guys that were into themselves. I mean, (laughs) yeah, it goes together. It went together well. I've told this story in a lot of podcasts over the years, but I was at the episode where the bromance returned and, so JB is, you know, saying to the crowd, don't go anywhere because, you know, a former TNA tag team champions are coming back. And no shit, dude. People in the crowd thought it was the Motor City Machine Guns. And I'm like, <laughs> I can assure you it's not fucking them. So <laughs> the the really odd thing, because Impact tapes really out of order, was that there was a ladder match. I believe it was for Grado's contract so he could be rehired again because he lost in the feast or fired or something like that. Jesse Goddard's had come down to try to get him off the ladder, you know, teaming mm-hmm. with Eli Drake. And no shit, 15 minutes later, they, uh, De- uh, I don't remember who the t- champions were. I don't think it was Decay. It might have been Decay. I just know there was an open challenge for the tag team champ. Oh, it was, uh, I think it was Beer Money, actually. But uh, open open challenge for a tag team championships. Robbie E came out. And then uh, there's Jesse Goddard's, like, just comes out and. There was never any kind of explanation or anything <laughs> on television, but it was really disappointing for me. That was that was one of the most disappointed I've been in a while because I really liked him and Eli Drake together. I liked the modern day Adonis, like just the the heel gimmick, and he was actually pretty funny. Do you remember when him? Uh, I want to say it's maybe Slam Anniversary 2014, 13, something like that, where they had like a pose down before the match, or it was a one night only, I think actually. But him and Robbie E had a pose down. Do you remember that? I didn't see it, but I remember it happening. I just remember laughing because he's he's taken all serious, and then Robbie E comes out doing some bullshit, and uh, Jesse Goddard is losing his mind on the microphone. Those are not sanctioned poses. <laughs> I mean, he just I don't know. He he had a really good groove with that. But we're talking about this 
entirely too long, the flashback. What I want to talk about is the the interview sessions backstage with Alicia and Ali and Kira and, and even Tessa too, which Tessa was hilarious when, when Alicia was all excited and was like, congratulations on, you know, she's all smiling on winning the knockouts championship and she's thanks. But what I wanted to get at is whether it's Ali being interviewed or it's Tessa Blanchard, they are saying the same shit every single week. It seems like really it's just the three of them because we get the, in these two backstage promos, we get Tessa addressing Allie's issue or her issues with Allie and then Allie, her issues with Sue Young. So it's just revolving around those three. And if they're trying to, and I know, I mean, I know we both have our predictions what they're going to do as far as Bound for Glory, but if, well, at least it seems like if they're really trying to do Ali versus Tessa, then they probably need to finish up Ali and Sue Young, and then you could work towards the Ali and Tessa. But it just seems right now it's just those three, and you know, one nobody's really. I don't want to say they're not feeling one another, but Tessa's focused on Ali. Ali's focused on Sue Young, and Sue Young's just Sue Young, <laughs> doing what the fuck she wants. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Man. Uh. It's just these promos, you know, they're just saying the same. There's no no change week in and week out. Week out. It's, you know, the same facial movements or facial expressions, I should say. It's just everything, the delivery, the words, everything, same, 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 same. Do you think that Ali is a more serious character? Because character? I tell people, be careful what you wish for. And I fully believe, fully believe if Ali would have joined Impact and, you know, everyone's like, where's Cherry Bomb? If she came in as Cherry Bomb, she would not be in the company right now. I, I 100% believe that. Not that she wasn't talented, but you remember back then how many girls they were bringing in with no kind of gimmick, no kind of anything. They were just coming coming in as a girl, coming in as a wrestler. And even some of the guys, then they never found a place for them. I mean, by the time they found a place for Braxton Sutter, they let him go. You know, by the time they found a gimmick for him. So I really, I really think Allie would have been on that same list. She, she would have been gone if she came in as a, a serious wrestler during that time. She wouldn't have had any momentum built. So I kind of tell people, be careful what you wish for a little bit too, because Allie was pretty good at what she did. Now she's the more serious character. Are you more invested in her? Or do you think, I guess I'm asking that question wrong. Do you think people are more invested in her? Or are they starting to sour from her? I think it's a combination between, and I've been consistent with this, they took too long to pull the trigger. There was too much stop and go with her progress. So now that, you know, she has, you know, she's been knockouts champion. It It's, it's I, I feel like, I guess I can just speak on my behalf. I feel like she doesn't need to be in the title picture right now. We know her background and she's always going to be a contender or be in the mix of things, I think people might want to see her do something else. Like, I'm of the mindset, why not have her feud with Kiera? I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily face versus heel. You can have kind of like the teacher versus the apprentice. It gives Ali something to do, taking her out momentarily out of the title picture while also helping Kiera because th this is kind of wasting Kiera. And I know you had mentioned that, you know, you're not particularly too high on her, but the whole point of bringing some of these women on board is thrusting them, having them work with people on the higher end of the card so we can get maybe down the road the impromptu matches where they're challenging for the knockouts championship. No one's saying they got to necessarily see it, uh, necessarily win, but it's something new and it's something fresh. And I just think with Ali, you know, we're, we, we really don't know where we're going because it's the same three people uh, involved with one another. There's nothing kind of breaking away. So I just think that, at least in my opinion, is where I'm just kind of like, you know, move on already. They've always had a knack for that with the knockouts. You know, even back when Gail had the title and when she was feuding with Maria, and um, you know, they've always had a knack for making, no matter how many women were in the division, making the knockouts division feel like it's two or three people. They've, they've always done that. I, and to clarify, I'm, I didn't say I wasn't high on Kiera. I was just, I mean, I think she's actually really talented. I, I would just say she's my least favorite knockout and that's not to say i don't like her i'm not i'm just not the biggest fan like she's not when she comes out i'm not like hey hey it's kiera I'm, I'm just like she's just she's kind of there for me but i think she's she's talented i do like her look and uh you know we really expected her 
when you know when they signed like her and uh Hanaya, you know, Hanaya was supposed to be the big signing and Kier was someone we felt was going to be another MJ Jenkins and just be gone right away. And she has uh, proven us wrong, proven us otherwise. So she's doing good with that. I just feel like Kiera is, is just a throw in, you know, it, it just, it, it's like, she just kind of stands there. She's, she's just there. I mean, it's, and maybe it's going somewhere that we just don't see it coming, you know, put it like that. Yeah. But it's, I just, I would have, I mean, I would have thought like, uh, maybe Alicia would have worked better with her or someone, someone who kind of has her same appearance a little bit, you know, cause then you can buy the similarities in character and everything. But it, it's just one of those things where I just felt where it's a missed opportunity because I had always thought, and I'm just looking at the ages. You look at Tessa, you look at Caro, they're around the same age, you know, on the, lower end of the 20s so i really felt like those are two girls that you could potentially build around so i always thought their mini feud that's something that you can have throughout their tenure so when they paired her with uh care with ali you know it's fine but you know now we just see her in backstage seg segments is essentially playing robin to ali's batman yeah so so instead of her just doing that and instead of just having ali challenge whoever's champion have them work together or have them tag up and, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't know who you'd have them work with, but give them both something to do. It gives Allie an opportunity to move away from the title picture momentarily, not saying that you can't put her back in, but it's just, we're just seeing now that it's whoever has a title, that's who Allie's going to chase. And it's the Gail Kim syndrome. Yep. 100%. I'm, I'm just curious to see how they handle the knockouts the rest of the year, because once Sue Young loses, what are they going to... I mean, she's lost a couple times, but they're, they're making it sound like Allie's going to put the fucking nail in the coffin. Like, we're never going to see this girl again. So, I, I just wonder, how do they blow off this feud? I'm, I'm very, very intrigued to see how they ultimately do this. The next match we get is Katarina versus Alicia. I was, I was happy to... I love Alicia. Love her. So, I was actually really excited to see this. I was disappointed that it was it was nothing. But at least Alicia got a victory. I, I will buy that. And maybe they'll... This reminds me of... Do, do you remember like a month ago they had a... They teased uh, Andrew Everett versus Desmond Xavier. And then Eddie came out and ruined the match. Yes. Dude, I was so pissed. Like, I, I remember my kid wasn't watching with me. But he was like watching TV in the other room. I was like, hey dude, you know... Desmond and Everett are going to fight. And he came running. Oh, hell yeah. And like, we're all excited for it. Nothing. So disappointing so and we never got it again after i thought maybe they'd give it to us but that's what it reminded me of uh we love joe hendry here in the household very very much and uh the song was pretty funny his indie work is a lot better with the music but um but this was this was pretty good you know he tied it tied in the katie lee paul Burchill stuff which was pretty funny um you got you got any thoughts on this overall i mean you know, we talked about last week that the delivery of the the heel turn you could say with Katarina wasn't wasn't too good. Um, it's act actually the whole thing has been super hokey, but you know we're finally there. <laughs> we're finally we finally see where they're going with it, which uh, you know we discussed was a possibility, and that's what they ended up rolling with. But you got any thoughts on this at all as far as just the pre match segment and um, you know the match itself? I felt like they made it too predictable. You could see kind of like a mile away that what was going to happen, it was going to be a distraction roll up. And I mean, if this breaks away the whole love triangle, fine. Now I want to see, can they put Katarina in the knockouts division, have her work, be a solid hand, helping some of the younger talents come up. And, you know, she has on her resume being a multiple multi-time knockouts champion. So I think she would be a great addition to the division, you know, break her away from this. But I don't really feel like this helped Alicia in any ways because it was so much stalling. Like, you knew what was going to happen. The moment that Alicia positioned herself right behind her, you knew we knew we were going to get the uh, distraction roll up. I wish they just did it different. I wish that Alicia instead, when Katarina turned around, catches her with a forearm, maybe whips her to the rope, clothesline, picks her up, hits her flatliner, and match over you know sometimes i just ugh, the roll up man but as i said i'm glad alicia i mean uh, alicia at least got a victory and it's really weird how they're using her because she's actually a predominant figure in the eddie side of things but then in the ring there's no no direction which is kind of kind of weird 
Josh Matthews does a Skype session with Johnny Impact, and at least there wasn't a. You remember who was he talking to last time? Where there it cut out. <laughs> awesome news. Oh, that sounded awful. I'm like, you know, this is a taped program. You got to redone it. I mean, awful. But talk with Johnny Impact. I I didn't care, but. I see what they're doing here. They injured Johnny Impact. They took him off TV. So they're trying to do a similar approach that they did with Moose and Austin Aries to where they're going to try to build it up, maybe through some video packages, maybe showing instead of working out, maybe showing Johnny Impact rehabbing, like if you can have like a throat injury or whatever. But, you know, it looks like they're kind of going to go. Do you feel like that they're going to try to do the same thing, keep Johnny Impact off TV and just keep Austin Aries on TV, maybe doing what he's doing? Because... With Moose, they kept both of them off TV. I think this time around, they're going to keep Austin Aries really causing problems. I mean, the whole set of tapings just end the show taking people out. You know, kind of a modern-day shield. I say modern-day. I know they're still a team, but they're whatever now. But I'm talking the way they used to be. So what would you get from it? I could see a scenario where they keep them off TV and probably we we get – uh, what are we calling Austin Aries Cross and Money Moose? Are we calling them, you know, the Dangerous... Well, I think Dangerous Alliance has been uh, used before, but we'll just call them the, the trio, okay? I know that's generic <laughs> as, as hell. That's but. awful. Moose Cross. <laughs> but anyways, I think we're going to get so many weeks of them just pretty much wrecking havoc and impact. And then finally, Johnny Impact is there to make the save. So because with him being in the main event slot... He's supposed to essentially save Impact. I mean, his name is Johnny Impact. So I think what they'll do is they'll have him sell this injury a little bit, and then eventually we'll get him to come and save the day. Yeah, so, something like that. Um, and it's weird because I'm sure we'll talk about this later, preview the show. I don't think it's the right time now to take the title off Aries because this is really intriguing what they're doing. But you can't just continue to have Johnny Impact lose. So interesting. We'll see. Next match is LAX versus the Fraternity. The Fraternity was pretty impressive, actually. They <laughs> really did some nice stuff. So they're doing something really different here where they're they're basically doing enhancement talent matches, so to speak. But the guys are getting their shit in, too. Like, they're competitive matches. I think what's just missing is that just announce the match as a match instead of, you know, LAX in action. You know, just say, hey, these guys are from here. There's a way to build it up a little bit better than they're doing, but it's nice to see what what are essentially uh, enhancement style matches just actually turn into competitive matches. So it's interesting. You got any thoughts on LAX versus the fraternity? I love this only for the simple fact, like I said, I'm always a fan of when they're giving us something out of the ordinary because normally when we see enhancement talent, they're already in the ring. They have some generic names two, three minutes, boom. But these guys got an, entr- an entrance. And, you know, they were they put on a competitive match, you can say. I mean, no doubt, of, once again, that we knew LAX was going to win this. But just doing all that, when you put all the time into that, for me as a fan, I'm able to buy in like, okay, hey, th- here's this new team. And, you know, they're probably just locals. Um, You know, they're probably not signed. And that's okay. But to give them a name and talk about each character and them having entrance music and – you know, this and that, I think that goes a long way. And so I'm always going to be a fan when we get these type of matches. After this, we get King and the OGs coming out, doing their, uh, you know, talking at LAX. King picks up the mic. I really felt like, I really felt like this, the audio of this show was just not, you know, whatever quality they rendered it to, it just wasn't the normal quality because I had a very difficult time listening, understanding King on the microphone and even Aries to an extent. I mean, I had to rewind a few of the things he said, so it definitely was not clear on the microphone. But I think I think uh, I think King did a did a good thing here, where he not a good thing, but it was definitely a heat generator when he says he wishes whatever when it came to hitting uh, little Richie. My kid was like, "What is he talking about?" And dude, I'm not getting a Father of the Year award anytime soon. I I was like, "Oh well, they hit a kid with a little kid with a car," and I was like, "Shit, I cannot believe I just told him that." Because he doesn't really necessarily know wrestling's not real. Like he he suspects that it's a bit of a show, but he's still young enough to kind of believe in it. And he his his fucking jaw dropped. Like he was so like he hit a kid, 
I'm like, oh no, no, buddy, he's okay. Like, <laughs> damage control, dude. I mean, it it just can't diarrhea of the mouth. I wish I would have come up with a different option, but King King definitely still got that gut on him, man. Like, you would never know looking at him otherwise. Like, you can tell he's a big dude, but he's actually surprisingly big because I'm, you know, I've met him and I've stood next to him, and he, uh, you know, I'm, I'm of average height. I'm five nine. Like, he towered me. He he's a lot bigger. He's got one of those like real painful handshakes. You know, someone shakes their hand, you're like, oh, please let go. Uh, oh. <laughs> just real like real strong grip, real. He he looks smaller to me on TV. You know, it, it's weird. Like he's actually a fairly big, big dude. But uh, yeah, anything on this at all with with uh, LAX and OGs? I mean, I, w- I wasn't I wasn't too crazy about it. I, I mean, I really like what they're doing, but th- this particular didn't do much for me other than King. Uh, getting a little bit of heat. I just, you know, with all the work King's done, you know, it just has you wishing that a that they were able to take the tag titles off of LAX between now and Bound for Glory, and b that OGs at least get one win out of this because for the promo work that King's been doing and it's been excellent by far. To see him keep coming up short, it just kind of just seems like a waste in in the end. So. I believe they said this match is not for the titles. I know we said that at Slammiversary, too, and they ended up being for the titles. I wish they weren't because you could have got OGs a victory back then. But I believe they said this time. Well, no, it can't be for the titles because Conan and King are wrestling. So they're not going to put. I mean, I know they've done wrestling companies have done worse things. Sometimes they put the title on the line if it's a six man. But but it's it's not on the line, which. Gives us some intrigue saying maybe the OGs pull it out, but if they do pull it out, where the hell does it go from there? I mean, they, they surely they cannot keep this thing going for too much longer. And I I don't see Homicide and Hernandez feuding with anyone else on the roster. I mean, I guess it could happen. I don't really see it. So the last match we're going to talk about is Brian Cage versus Congo Kong. Very much out of nowhere, you know, it's really weird because they were building up that Johnny Impact was going to get his on Congo Kong. So what did he throw him in the pool and that was it? He won the feud? Yeah, that was silly. There was no follow-up with that. But you know what? I mean, in seeing this match, and it was a good match. I mean, we already know between him and Johnny Impact where the match was going to go. I really feel like with Congo Kong, man, a guy with so much potential, he could be used in so many different ways. I mean, they make it hard to buy him as a credible monster because every time he's in these uh, big matches with a big opponent, he comes up short. Yeah, and he, he was excellent this match. This the, the match was actually really short. It was like four minutes long, which was kind of disappointing because a couple nights ago, a couple nights ago, a couple months ago, they had an excellent match, a match no one saw coming. That match was outstanding. So you're kind of thinking you're getting a sequel to this. Now, it was good, and, you know, Kong running down the ramp and flying over the ropes and everything, like, I don't know how he does this shit. Like, I asked him, how do you do it? Like, because he, he does the moonsault. I'm like, how do you physically do that? Like, that just you know boggles my mind Mm -hmm. um my kid (laughs) he uh this is like a month ago he's like i wish i could have saw brian cage versus lashley i said well he did wrestle lashley twice and he beat him and he's like he beat lashley twice i'm like yeah and my kid very serious turns his head looks out the window goes he really is unstoppable (laughs) (laughs) he's a big cage fan i was like i promise we will meet him somewhere sometime I will make it happen, I promise. Um, but the match was actually pretty good. It was just short. And, and like you said, you know, what the hell they do with Kong? He didn't have Jimmy Jacobs out there because he was taken out by Johnny Impact. Oh, because, okay, I remember they were acting like they were going to have a match. But instead, he rest, He gave him a, he had to wrestle um, Jimmy Jacobs instead. Yeah, and then we seen where Congo Kong looked silly getting tossed in uh in that wherever they were at. But uh yeah, they you know what uh, and I just kinda just feel like with anybody in with this company, there's always a place for people. And I just think with him, no one's saying he has to win every match, but 
it needs facing Congo Kong like it needs to seem like a big deal. I really feel like what they might do, and I hope they don't go down this road. But anytime they want to give Cage like you know really display his strength, they're gonna have him face Congo Kong because you know he can you know F five Congo Kong kind of similar to like what they used to do earlier with Big Show and Brock Lesnar. Anytime they wanted to put Brock Lesnar over as his beast, he'd face Big Show and just throw Big Show around like a rag doll. Or Mark Henry, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, and I, man, I just I hope they find something for Kong because it's really promising and putting him with, him with Jimmy Jacobs. Uh, I didn't know Jimmy Jacobs was of such small stature. I'd, I'd never really seen him wrestle, so <laughs> he took off his shirt to fight, fight Johnny Impact. I was like, this guy's tiny. Holy shit. But I hope they find something for him, man, because I like Kong a lot, and I think it's a breath of fresh air to just get a character like this in wrestling, you know, just that monster character. It's it's cool. So hopefully they, they find something for him to do. Overall episode I thought was, was pretty good. I really do. I just, you know, last last week i was like eh, it's just a show and they're doing some tremendous work but uh i was very happy with this one and the crazy thing was this is the very last episode for toronto and usually what would happen in the marathon tapings in orlando was they would start checking out towards the end you could tell the wrestlers were tired the fans were tired tired now we're doing the quick two-day tapings they last a month you know and they're able to do it because they're selling tickets uh so they're able to afford it it's just really good programming. It's very consistent programming. Anything uh, as, as a closer on this? And do we know anything about next week's show? Uh, we don't know. All we know is they're going to Mexico. They didn't really announce anything. I will say Canada's been awesome. I mean, the Canada crowd, man, they – and this isn't to poo-poo on the Orlando crowd or anything, but Canada's just been amazing. And you can tell that the wrestlers really thrived off that environment. People felt engaged, you know, they were going with whatever was being presented and creative just did a fantastic job. They is really been entertaining. Like this episode, I found it to be from top to bottom, very entertaining. So let me ask before we close out now, after the Mexico tapings, is that leading us up to bound for glory? Yeah. This is like, are they coming? Yeah. And are they, will they be coming back to Canada or the rest of the year, they're going to go somewhere else? Um, I don't know. So New York is going to be in October after Bound for Glory. And then November is Las Vegas. And they haven't talked about December yet. I would not be surprised if they go to Orlando. But hopefully they're staying out of there. But I wouldn't be surprised if they go to Orlando. Well, Canada needs to be a staple. I I think they've established they know what they got in Canada. They know what the turnout's going to be. That needs to be a staple for them where, where, you know, they need to make make it a concerted effort to go back to Canada. I've seen some screenshots and videos of the Mexican crowd. It's it's a pretty good crowd. It's pretty uh, energetic and pretty full in there. So um, so it's going to be some good television, I think. I I saw, unfortunately, in freaking – What's his name? The president of of Anthem. Uh, that was his name. Nordholm. Nordholm. Ed Nordholm. He he posted it, and uh, of course there was like a spoiler within <laughs> the the freaking picture, kind of like when he posted uh, El Patron and everything. It was just a spoiler, like storyline wise, I guess you should say. I don't know if I call it a spoiler, but gave us an idea of what's going to happen with a cer- certain feud. But really excellent stuff. Uh, I know Aerostar is going to be at the tapings. Uh, Puma King, and then they did announce one match. I, I don't remember her name, but um, one of the local Mexican stars is taking on Alicia Edwards. So that's uh, that's basically all they've said. But I really think this Bound for Glory build is really going to... That's why I brought up Taya, you know, possibly returning. They, they posted a picture of the knockouts the other day, and she was not in it. But I would think if it's going to be a surprise, they probably wouldn't do that. So who knows? I think the tapings... Yeah, yes, I think they've already happened, so... Hopefully we can avoid anything. It's probably fantasy booking on my part, but I really think with this Bound for Glory build, they're going to take advantage of pushing people who are either, you know, of Latin descent or are popular there in country. So it's going to be good stuff. I cannot, I cannot wait to see what they do and uh, what the setup looks like. I hope it's more similar to this than it than the Impact Zone in Orlando. I hope they don't get back to that. I think they really want to have a different feel. So. Uh, I think that will do it unless you got anything else. 
no, just you know, another great episode. Once again, I got to say the Canada crowd was awesome. And I I think what Impact is going to start doing is as they're going to, you know, Mexico and New York, if the turnout is very well, these are places in 2019 we could see them revisiting. Yeah, very, very, very much so. I think they're going to still try the Chicago. I wouldn't be surprised to try Chicago. I could see them doing Northern California because they – with big time wrestling partnering with them, they were they they were doing fairly well. I think they're going to look at some of the one night only and Twitch crowds and say, okay, where are the areas that we can we can do work in? You know, the Brace for Impact show had a thousand people show up, like like a damn pay per view. So I think they're going to look at it. But really, really good stuff to see them on the road and selling tickets and and um, you know they're formatting the the television to where it doesn't look like it's an empty crowd. Like with Orlando, they put so many fans on TV. That you 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 just couldn't help but to watch them being unengaged, or if, if there's people getting up from the bleachers, you could see empty spots in the bleachers. Now it's kind of like we're we're gonna make sure we have a you know minimal view of paying audience and really focus on the in in ring action. And uh, you know Ring of Honor has kind of a similar setup, so really good stuff. Hope you enjoyed the show this week. Really good episode of Impact Wrestling. This is BQ for Row. Check us out next week as well. Talk to you later. Peace. Don't forget to leave a thumbs up. And for more from the Impact Lounge, check out the videos below.